Not the greatest lighting. Let me get that. All right. So, close this real quick. All right, we finally got some sun after a lot of rain here. So that was really nice to, to have. Um, bear with me as I figure out if we do any sort of screen sharing here. Maybe, maybe not. Okay, well, thank you much, so much, everyone, for joining me in this lovely afternoon out here in California or other time zones if you're tuning in from other areas. Um, today, we will be talking about koi. And I got to admit, they're kind of my favorite when it comes to patients because they're big. Uh, it's really a lot, a little bit more fun to work on a bigger animal because you can do a lot more for them. So, I mean, koi are carp. They're basically really big goldfish. Um, two different species, obviously. You have your Crassius aratus, which is our goldfish descended from Crucian carp. And then we have our, well, it's not Cyprinus carpio koi for much longer. Uh, a lot of these species tend to get reassigned over time. Um, those are descendants of common carp, which turn into our koi. But yes, I love working with koi. It's about 80% of what we work with in our clinic. And I really wish I could figure out a way <laughs> to uh, show you guys some different pictures. Hang on with me here. Um, obviously I'm not that adept at, <laughs> at YouTube live. So I apologize. Maybe I'll try to hold my, hold my camera up to the, up to the mic here. Um, so like I said, about 80% of what I work on with is koi. And again, I did just write a book on all things koi. Um, it's called how to kill your koi. It just came out last October and I know the title is a little confusing, but every chapter is based on a myth that I have heard of in my, my 10 years in practice. So I'll give you an example here. Um, I, for the chapter on water quality is my water looks clean, so I don't need to test it. Well, obviously that's not the case. Um, when it comes to water quality and your fish's health, testing your water is essential. So yes, just because my glass of water here looks clean, I mean, it's clear there's no particulates, but I can't tell you the pH of this water. I can't tell you the alkalinity. I can't tell you the chlorine levels. Uh, it's really pretty much impossible to tell that a water sample is healthy just by how it looks. So one of the particular interests I have at Koi is nutrition. So I actually just came from an aquaculture conference out in New Orleans and got to talk with a lot of different feed manufacturers that, you know, do salmon and trout and all these different species. Not a lot of carp raised for, for food out here, but obviously it's going to, it's going to be the same again, our common carp, same, same as koi. So in talking with those food reps, again, what we're doing is a very, very tiny production medicine pond. Um, discussing what they have as far as nutrition for koi is very beneficial because I think a lot of koi owners are easily swayed by marketing. It, it happens. It happens for any single pet food. Marketing is really kind of where they get you. So for, for our book in particular, the chapter on nutrition starts out with the myth that the most expensive koi food is the best for your fish. Well, absolutely not. Uh, it just comes down to when you're in a store, and this is for any product you're going to buy, and you're overwhelmed by options. They've done studies on this. You're basically going to come down to maybe two, you know, decision makers. What looks like it's the best and what, you know, price point am I looking at? So a lot of owners, we, you know, you think high price point, better product, when really a lot of these companies they are not using very good products in their fish food and they're charging you a lot of money for it. I mean, there's many cheap diets out there that are common. So again, the Hikari, the Tetra, 
But these are perfectly fine and complete for your fish. And obviously they're not going to be, you know, taking a top dollar amount. So again, I just want to make sure that you are aware that you're not necessarily getting what you pay for. So I'm happy to do more talks on nutrition. Um, Koi is just something that I have a lot of experience with and I I'm happy to share those, those, you know, things that I have learned over the years. Again, I get it. There's not a lot of resources available, e even for veterinarians. Um, a lot of what I have learned has come from my own research, comes from discussion with other veterinarians and some of the hmm, more recent literature. Um, Dr. Lee Clayton and Kat Hatfield's uh, clinical book of fish medicine actually has a body scoring condition for koi, which hasn't been done before. And again, depending on if you have backyard fish versus show fish, um, they're going to require a different, um, different body profile. But yes, I love talking about nutrition. I love talking about koi health. Mm. What I really wanted to share with you was a case that I actually got to work on this morning. So we have a koi pond that is about an hour south of here, um, has some higher end fish. You know, we're talking, you know, at least ten, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000 of fish. And it's legitimately the only high end pond that I have in my repertoire as of right now. We've had some issues with fish that were brought in about four and a half months ago. Um, I suspect the night that they were added, they were just a little stressed out, trying to get the lay of the place. And two of them kind of came together and ran into a wall. So unfortunately, the, you know, night after or the day after these fish were added, owner comes out, two fish are, you know, on their sides on the bottom of the pond. One made a fairly quick recovery. Um, she was back up and swimming within about 24 hours. Other fish down on the bottom a little bit longer. So we took her up, not necessarily out of the water entirely. We kind of kept her partially submerged the whole time because I was worried about potential spinal trauma. So owner has a great measuring tub that's up on little feet. So I was able to slide my radiograph plate under the fish and actually shoot her radiographs or x-rays through the fish, you know, submerged in water and onto the plate. And we were able to note that she did in fact have spinal trauma. So koi have little X shaped vertebrae, and this is common for pretty much all fish, including your chondriacthes, your cartilaginous fish. So you could see that those, those X's were kind of squished together in one spot and a little bit more spread out. So we started her on some antibiotics, some anti-inflammatories, and she recovered over a period of a couple days. Coming out later, um, about three months later, she was clinically normal. So she was up and swimming just fine. Took the radiographs again, and they looked exactly the same. So even though the fish had, you know, this this trauma, she 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 was, you know, presenting clinically normally. She was up and swimming. But the other fish that had been in whatever accident occurred, um, has very slowly been declining. And unfortunately now has been kind of stuck in the bottom for about a month and a half. So did radiographs on her and she also unfortunately has spinal trauma, but what we've come to find is she's actually been able to artificially inflate her caudal swim bladder. So in Koi, they have two chambers of their swim bladder. They have a cranial and a caudal. And usually the caudal is about a quarter to a third of the size of the cranial. And again, being physostomous fish, they're able to swallow air. And there is a duct that goes from their esophagus to the conjunction of their two swim bladders. And this is how they're able to maintain neutral buoyancy. So even though this fish, you know, the spine is a little screwed up, she's been trying to, again, put a little bit more air in there so she doesn't have to work too hard. Um, she's unfortunately gotten some ulcers on her belly now because she's been on the bottom for so long. So with, with some of these cases that are not really great for treatment, um, I called up some of my colleagues that do koi, um, Dr. Shane Boylan, formerly of the Dubai Sea World, and Dr. Gregory Lubart, who is pretty much the fish guru um, out of NC State. So they were able to give me a treatment protocol that's including anti-inflammatories, antibiotics, and steroids. 
So we're going to try her for, for a while and see how it goes. But there was another fish, also of the same batch, no history of trauma. Decided for some reason to sit on the bottom with that other little fish. And she'd been down there for about five weeks, again, having the same issues with ulcers. So popped her up on the same radiograph. Um, with her in particular, though, we did what's called a standing. You know, it's not standing, but <laughs> it's upright radiographs. So that's when a lateral beam is shot through the fish. So we can see if there's any, you know, fluid hiding in the swim bladder. And with this other fish, her name is Nani, there, there was a lot of fluid in there. And I can actually see it on the radiograph, which is awesome because I, I can drain fluid. That's something I can definitely do. It's really hard to fix spinal trauma. Um, other veterinarians have tried putting spinal plates and screws and there's some help with it. But you really need a kind of a sterile space, a big team, which, again, we're not we're not quite at that stage yet. So this other fish fluid in the swim bladder. Um, this She's a big girl. She's a 28-pound koi. So my little one-and-a-half-inch needles really weren't going to be able to get into her swim bladder. And trust me, I tried. So I had to wait and order three-inch three inch spinal needles. And I'm going to try this because I, I just want to show you what these look like. Again, I'm going to hold this picture up to my phone. So you can see, you can see how big... Hold it back a little bit. I apologize. <laughs> So I'm used to doing this on Zoom. So you can see how big those needles are. Again, three inch needles. Had them all the way into the hub. So all the way into the fish. I was able to get fluid out. And it was, again, sorry, show and tell with these pictures are not, not the greatest. Um, it was this nasty, purulent, basically bacterial ridden fluid, which was kind of what I was hoping for. Now, so... When fish have water in their swim bladder, so for our physostomus, koi, and goldfish, it can be bacterial, which again, it's the bacteria that's producing fluid in there that causes that lovely purulent grossness, and it smells delightful, let me tell you. And then we have a, a pneumatic duct disorder, basically that duct that goes between their esophagus and their swim bladder should just be pushing air, but sometimes it's water. And with that, what I would have expected to pull back would it would be the same as the pond water. So again, same pH, same clarity, which it wasn't. But obviously, if it's bacterial, I can put antibiotics in there and kill off those bacteria. So again, treatable. Pneumatic duct disorder, not as easy to treat. So I was able to pull out 350 milliliters of that gross fluid from that poor little fish. And I was doing it in, in 10 mil increments because if we use a syringe that's bigger than that, it just puts a lot of pressure on the swim bladder and we can cause, you know, just have kind of affect that elasticity overall. So I did 10, 10 mil pulls of that gross fluid and then started putting air back in. Cause again, you don't want to you know, completely shrivel up the swim bladder, it's going to have some structural issues. So did that, got 350 mils out of the cranial swim bladder, and then tried to go into the caudal swim bladder. And thankfully with radiographs, I was actually able to see where about the two, the two swim bladders were located because again, it's a fish. Sometimes they, they put things in weird spaces. So Anyway, I put the needle into the caudal swim bladder because even though there's a little duct between the cranial and caudal swim bladder, it's supposed to move air. So not really sure how well fluid was going to move across that, but got into the caudal chamber, no fluid, only air. Awesome. I, I still put some antibiotics in there anyway. Um, but oh, when we put her back in the pond, she was swimming. She was swimming up. I'm... It's just, it's, I, I know it, it's, it's a really, it's a really silly, silly video to watch as I, so, oh, yeah, let me see if I can get this. Again, I apologize for the, the awkwardness of this, but you can see all the little fish. You can't see that at all, can you? Um, <laughs> sorry about that, but it was all these beautiful koi and she was just swimming with the pack again. And it was lovely. It, it's really satisfying to be a veterinarian and be able to help, you know, kind of an instantaneous fix. 
So again, there is still some fluid in the swim bladder. Um, we aren't able to really get it out entirely, just given, you know, a three inch needle trying to direct that through a lot of muscle. Um, it's very hard. So again, antibiotics were infused into the swim bladder and then it'll just take a little time for that, that fluid to be cleared out. Um, there's probably going to be some residual fluid in there for her life. Um, uh, it's just, unfortunately the structure of the swim bladder itself, um, isn't, isn't used to moving water back and forth through that membrane. So it's made to hold air. It's basically a big balloon. So, you know, if you think of a latex balloon, if you fill it full of water, again, water balloon, but it, it, the water doesn't, doesn't come out. So again, it's going to take some time for that just to be absorbed by some of the vascular structures. There aren't many of them, unfortunately, but she's up, she's swimming. Yay. Uh, we're going to keep our fingers crossed and toes and fins for the other little girl who is unfortunately stuck on the bottom with spinal trauma. Um, with one of my colleagues, again, being a SeaWorld veterinarian, um, they, they've tried to culture a lot of big open ocean fish that really aren't used to having any walls in general. So he is very versed these days on collisions and kind of what the treatment is for that. So I really appreciate having friends and colleagues that can help me with these problems. Um, because again, we will all eventually write the book of all things koi medicine, but I haven't gotten there yet, mostly because I haven't had the time. And I'd rather, again, with this book, it's it's written for anyone. It's not just written for veterinarians, even though it has a lot of good information in there. So we have a question about feeding processed dry balls being the main source of nutrition for our pets. Is the pellet process the same as the kibble process? Yes, it is absolutely the same. It is a dry extruded pellet. Yes, it is good overall nutrition, but I agree with you, you know, adding in some fresh foods is, is great. But we, again, with nutrition in some of these species, we're extrapolating from aquaculture, which is very heavy in production. And incorporating all those other things into the diet it is very hard. I mean, again, just came from a conference on this. You should see the advances that they have made in getting nutrition into, you know, a, com a complete little pellet. I have one colleague that's doing a study on essential oils and how that improves immune function. So we're actually going to be doing a trial with one of their companies to see if, again, they've shown great innovation and um, let's see, it's trout and shrimp. Um, yes, even, even shrimp, they need to have shrimp diets as well. So Yes, absolutely. Um, a lot of people like going the pelleted route. Um, you're welcome to, you know, give them treats on top of it. Pellets are built as a complete diet, but if you really want to take the time and tailor out a fresh diet, um, we do have clients that like to do that for their fish. We always recommend that you discuss that with a veterinarian um, just to make sure that the fish are getting enough protein and not too much fat. So, Big difference in the diets between, say, a koi versus a dog versus a cat. Koi really need for at least a maintenance diet around 30 to 35 percent protein. Anything more than that, again, they're, they're carp. They have almost unlimited potential for growth. You're, you're going to be pushing them to grow faster, which is fine if you have the space or if you're, you know, growing up juveniles, if you are breeding fish. But for most pond owners in their backyard, again, down 30 to 35, again, 35 is probably pushing it a little bit. But again, this is our maintenance diet. So you can obviously, you know, supplement that with some of your low calorie treats such as peas. You know, some of them like lettuce. I don't like lettuce. A lot of fish don't like lettuce, which is fine. They're obviously going to eat the plants in your pond most of the time. Some, some koi are very nice and don't touch plants, but a lot of them just rip them to shreds. Um, and they're really not getting nutrition per se out of a lot of those. Um, they're mostly eating the bug larvae that loves to live in plant roots. They are going after those tasty, crunchy bugs because that is part of their, their native diet. So again, protein, you're looking for about 30 to 35%. Fat. Um, again, these are not the, the most the, the most exercisingly conscious fish uh, they 
they have the good life. They don't need to, you know, swim giant ponds, fight other fish for territory. They are living the good life. And a lot of the times they don't have a lot of room to really cruise around. So the fat content for them, we want to try to keep that as low as possible. So we're talking five, six, seven percent. There are some koi diets that put 12% fat in there, which everyone, especially in the koi show world, they're like, yeah, their body confirmation is great. And here I'm sitting, yeah, you got an obese fish. Um, yeah, uh, ob obesity is, is a problem in a lot of pet fish species, just because, again, as owners, we, you know, we feel bad. They can't join us. They can't sit at the table or jump into bed with us. So we'll give them maybe some inappropriate treats, um, especially stuff that is high in fat. For koi, those, those dumb little Cheetos come to mind. Um, they're about as healthy for fish as Cheetos are for us, but I do love Cheetos. So give them to your fish, just not, not that often. But again, th these are things that when you're walking through the pet store, it, it's very easy to get overwhelmed. And if you have to go through every single ingredient list, every single nutrition list, it's a lot and it becomes overwhelming. So, you know, we're just going to make a decision based on what color the bag is, what name it has, what's the price point. So either you're going to grab the cheapest because, again, you just you just need something to fill their belly. Who cares? You know, it's just a fish Not for us. Um, or you're going to grab the most expensive bag, even though what's in that expensive bag really probably isn't isn't always the best thing in there. There, there are some legitimate brands that have put extra effort into research that, you know, warrant the more expensive price tag. Um, if you're familiar with the Hikari brand, um, there is the Saki Hikari brand. Um, so they claim that it produces less waste and there has been one study done, but it wasn't peer reviewed and it's never been replicated. So I have a lot of clients who really like that diet. Again, the fish like it. Ingredients are okay. Sure. Fine. Go ahead. It <laughs> It's a perfectly legitimate diet. Um, does it carry the, you know, elevated price tag? And I'm a little bit hesitant on that. So again, all of our fun information on koi. So there is a question on fish TB. So this is commonly known as also fish mycobacteria. So we really don't see this that commonly in koi. Not really sure why. Um, we do see it in a lot of more warmer water fish species. So the two species of fish that I have worked with that we have seen this in is seahorses and betta fish. Why those two? I, I have no idea. Um, biggest issue with mycobacterium, it has a very specific protective outer coating, which basically makes it almost impossible for antibiotics to get in there. Now, with this particular bacteria, um, what it does primarily in the disease process is form abscesses. So these are little coalescing pockets of dead white blood cells, mostly macrophages, that will kind of hold on to that little, you know, bacteria. Then it's it's still going to be growing and replicating, but it just kind of grows in a little pool. And with that, unfortunately, the, the really the biggest clinical scene sign you see there is a fish that just slowly declines. You know, they might have some kidney issues. They might look like they have bacterial issues, but any your treatment with antibiotics really doesn't go anywhere. So I have a, a beta right now. Um, his name is Will. He's about two and a half years old. So again, he's he's pushing kind of up into the, the the later beta years. But he's had um, asymmetrical exophthalmia. So one of his eyes has been popped out further than the other for a while. Again, this this could be trauma related too. But now he's starting to have some pine coning. Um, so that edema, that dropsy appearance, again, this is an indication that likely the kidneys are starting to shut down. So we tried him on a couple different antibiotics with, with no success. Um, appetite has been slowly going down. And then this, this fish has been under treatment for at least a year. So again, given the fish species, given the presentation, I strongly suspect that this is a mycobacterial infection. However, there is no anti-mortem test for it. So I can't do any sort of diagnosis on a live fish. 
Um, you really need a fresh dead animal that's sent off to a lab. There is a special stain that they do to look for essentially that outer coating. It's called an acid fast stain. And if that, you know, lights up, that is a, that is an, a confirmed mycobacterial case. Do many fish get that, tr that workup? Obviously not. When we have suspected, obviously we will send that off. It's a very simple test provided we have a fresh sample. So unfortunately, no matter what type of fish you have, if the sample is not fresh enough, um, fish tissue just deteriorates very quickly. And then we have, unfortunately, everything in their environment, fish, fish live in a toilet, is going to start taking advantage of them. So again, it can cause what looks like a bacterial infection when it's really just secondary bacteria that are taking advantage of a dead fish. The other issue with mycobacteria is it is a zoonotic disease. It's it's not anything severe, um, but obviously if you have small children, elderly, immunocompromised people in the house, you want to make sure that they do not handle the water specifically. The animal, again, nobody, nobody really likes to handle the animals except the vets or if you're transferring them between systems. But again, it is a zoonotic disease, so there is a risk of people getting sick from this. Um, usually it's just, you know, non-healing kind of pustules on your hands, which yeah, lots of fun. That sounds, um, get, it is not related to the tuberculosis that cows and humans get. It's kind of a more milder form, but again, you always want to make sure that your, your loved ones are not going to get sick from your fish. So question here, um, how often do you see fish that aren't goldfish or koi? Well, it's pretty rare. Um, again, about 80% of our clinic is going to be koi. About 15% is going to be goldfish, 3% betas, and then so 2% everything else. Um, this includes saltwater tanks. This is corals. This is cichlids. This is weird saltwater fish. Um, again, I mean, we we just were the area that we are are in, koi are a really hot commodity out here. I mean, we have a lot of fish coming directly into San Jose from Japan. So yes, we have fish that are flown in planes over from Japan. And these fish are usually fairly small. So again, plane ride for a fish, <laughs> not fun. Not fun for me, you know, coming on a plane late last night. And then we have plane rides for really big fish. And again, the stress and trauma of putting that putting a fish in a bag, in a box, on a plane for, for several hours. Um, I can't imagine what these little fish go through on this plane. Um, but but anyway, they make it to the other end. And again, hopefully fairly healthy. They'll go on the vendor and then they sell from there. But in, in our area of California, we have a lot of people that are directly importing fish in addition to those that are kind of just born and sold throughout the area. So yeah, lots of fun things when it, when it comes to koi. Um, question, um, a lot of fish are carriers of TB and not affected. I honestly cannot comment on that. Um, some of my colleagues that work with tropical fish, um, we have the Tropical Aquaculture Lab down in Ruskin, Florida. I have a couple colleagues who work there. Um, obviously, they are more aware of it than me. I unfortunately, you know, given some of the limitations sometimes of the clients, especially with the littler fish, um, we're not sending out a ton of samples. And obviously, you know, fish dies from chlorine toxicity, severe ulcer, parasites, some other issue. We're not really going to go check for myco. Um, it's just, it's, I mean, it is suspected. It is an environmental pathogen. I mean, we find myco in so many different environments in many forms. So I, I mean, I would think that it would be the case, but I really don't have the the research to kind of to to back it up. Um, again, my colleagues, um, Dr. Ruth Francis Floyd and Dr. Ruth, uh, Ruth Roy Nong out of the Tropical Aquaculture Lab, um, they've been the one that I go to for a lot of my myco. They have a bunch of papers about it. Um, let me see if I can find Dr. Ruth's and I will put it in the comments. Let me see if I can find that real quick. Um, yeah, it's just not as 
com. There we go. Hopefully this is the right one. Okay. Yeah. So this is Dr. Francis Floyd. I'm gonna put this up in the comments if anybody wants to take a look at that. Um, that that's just a good fact sheet overall. Um, let's see the year on this. It, it is unfortunately a little outdated. It's from 2011. Um, so maybe this has been updated, but again, just in my personal experience, I, I haven't tested for it enough, but it's mostly those betas. So again, try to focus more on Koi. We will have beta hour next month. So if you have any beta questions, happy to answer it. Then I'll give you a sneak preview for betas. They need a heater and a filter and that will fix most little beta issues. Um, there was a comment on pine coating being the kiss of death. Yes and no. And I actually have a really cool koi case that I want to share with you that is ironically from the exact same pond of the koi with the spinal issues. It seems the more expensive fish you get, the more weird and outlandish their health issues are. So this fish has been in the pond since he brought them down from Redding, I think it was eight years ago. So she's about, I think we calculated about 12 years old. Her name is Lovey. She is a reserve grand champion from the San Jose show. I want to say 2016. She's a beautiful, big girl. She was presenting to us with a patch of edema. So that pine coning it was about, say, this large on one of her sides. So when you have a presentation like that in a koi, our first differential diagnostic is trauma or bruising. So wanted to see if there was any parasites, you know, something that was making her itchy that would cause her to bruise and, you know, that one specific spot. And after a while, it kind of went away, except for, you know, a smaller patch of area. And then, you know, a couple months later, it started to come back. And she also had some symptoms of having conjunctival ulcers. So that is the tissue that is down under here in your eye was inflamed. Again, have I seen this in any other koi or patient since? No. Start her on some antibiotics. She made a pretty good recovery. The little swelling went away. And she was good for about eight months. And then that swelling was back. Again, just focal area in the exact same spot. But now we're on the other side of the fish. I, I had to take my camera out to prove to the owner that this was not the same spot that it had been previously. But it was actually now on the other side of the fish. So we tried some more antibiotics and it wasn't resolving at all. So at this point, I was a little concerned about what might be going on internally. So there was another fish that was in with Lovey. Her name was Princess. She was the grand champion when Lovey was the reserve grand champion um, who passed away a few years prior to her with a gonadal sarcoma. So if the you know, growth is sitting on one of the kidneys. Um, obviously, it might cause the filtration capacity in that side to be hindered. So I was worried that there was a tumor pressed up against one of her kidneys. So the best way to see this was with a CT scan. Yes, fish can get CT scans. We have one up on our YouTube page that is actually a different fish, but it is great at looking at all the little organs inside. So... Basically, what you do with this is, thankfully, we had a very nice specialty animal clinic that was right down the road. The owner packed up the fish in a bag in a box, drove, I want to say 10 minutes down the road. We unloaded her out into her big tub, used some MS-222 to knock her out, because for this procedure, she's got to hold really, really still. And then I was in charge of lifting this 30-pound fish up onto the gantry, and then they were going to position her get her all kind of laid out. And then the scan is very quick. It only takes about 30 seconds to a minute, depending on how many cuts they do. So we got her up, do our little scan. I scoop, I scoop back in, scoop her out, put her back in the water. So again, she's out of the water, maybe 60 seconds, um, which for most fish is completely doable. So looking around, you know, with the scan, I mean, there's something kind of weird in the back end. Um, koi, have this fascinating, fascinating thing with their kidneys that I didn't know until I actually did a necropsy on one. They have accessory kidney lobes. So most fish will have the cranial kidney um, or the head kidney. This is responsible for making blood cells. 
they don't have bone marrow like we do or other animals. Their head kidney is their hematopoietic organ. So it makes red blood cells, make white blood cells. And then the back half, and there's really no way to tell front versus back, works like a normal kidney. So this is our filtration kidney. And koi have two accessory kidney lobes that actually will, they're, they're little, like the oysters on a chicken, they kind of wrap around the two lobes of the swim bladder. And they're filtration kidneys. So who knew that koi had extra filtration capabilities? Um, so anyway, I suspect, you know, there was, there was something funky going on with that, getting back to our CT scan. So then we did another pass with contrast. So this is um, a radio opaque pigment that we're actually able to put into the bloodstream. Not going to, not going to hurt the fish at all. Um, if you've ever had any sort of angiogram done, um, it's very similar. Just, it's not radioactive or anything like that. So yes, you can do IV injections on, on koi. Again, it helps when they are big. So <laughs> lot, the vessels are a lot bigger. Um, I actually put the, the contrast into her caudal tail vein. So they have a really big vein that runs under their spinal cord all the way to the tip of the tail. So um, I'm really good at hitting it on big fish from the side. Um, usually you go kind of, do I have a fish? Oh, I have a fish doing, hang on. So here we have our koi. Um, so again, here is our lateral line down the side, which about mimics the spinal cord. So if we go all the way down, to the tail here, again, that vessel is going to run right underneath the tail. So usually you go, so this is his, his belly here. You usually go straight in ventrally till you hit the vertebral column and kind of back off till you get blood. Obviously there's no tag here. Um, for the big chunky fish, um, trying to go through this is just not possible. They're just, they're too chunky. So you got to go laterally and it's kind of at like a 45 degree angle up to the side. And I don't know what, powers I have been given. I cannot hit a ventral stick. I can only, I can only go laterally, which is supposed to be harder, but for me, it's just what works for me. So anyway, I was able to put IV contrast in there and then we did another scan. And what was weird about this is the kidney that was on the same side. Well, it might not have been a kidney was taking up all of the pigment. So what that means is there was a structure in there that was highly vascularized. So lots of blood vessels that were taking up all this pigment. And again, was on the same side where that fish was getting really puffy. So I'm not sure exactly what that structure was. I suspect there might've been some damage to the kidney, but since then she has miraculously healed entirely. All the swelling is gone. So if she makes it another year, I'm going to ask the owner if we can take her for another CT to see if that defect is still there. And she's just able to compensate. But she's she's getting up there with all the other health issues that they've had in this pond. Um, might not be the best the best idea to, to keep asking him for, for more fish treatments. So question about worrying about feeding koi when it gets too cold. Yes, we get asked this question a lot. So obviously where you live in the world, too cold is going to mean many different things. Here in our area of California, the water is usually going to get maybe into the 40s. I think my coldest pond this this year was the four, was 40 and it was it was my own goldfish pond and I was checking the temperature as I was cleaning it. Uh, yeah, that wasn't fun. So at that temperature, again, it's not freezing. So those little goldfish are using getting fed maybe about once a week. Again, koi, goldfish, outdoor ponds, pretty much going to have the same feeding schedule. If you are in an area of the world where the top will actually ice over. So we have clients in Denver, my mentor out of Buffalo, New York. Again, all those northern climates all over the world. If you're getting ice on top of your pond, um, that's definitely a time to probably cut back on the feeding. Now, it depends on, you know, how much ice and your fish's personality. Um, it, from what I have collected from my colleagues, it's really best if you're actually able to feed your fish a little bit throughout the winter. And it's because without any food going into the GI tract, um, those little villi that absorb material, you know, same in our small intestine, 
they start to atrophy because they they have nothing to do. So by giving them a little something to do, it actually improves, you know, their function and their performance throughout the winter. So we've come to find, and this is anecdotally, unfortunately, I haven't been able to write up a paper. I, I'm a little befuddled as to how I'd actually do it, but there's one of my colleagues is working on this. But by giving them a little bit of food throughout the winter, they seem to have a better immune response in the, in the spring. So how, how am I kind of quantifying this? So with some clients that I have had, again, we're, we're at our 10 year mark right now. So I've had some clients that I've seen again and again, every spring. And for the first couple of years, you know, their fish were having some issues coming back into spring, you know, having some low grade bacterial infections, starting to see some parasite outbreaks. And with a little bit of feeding, you know, throughout the winter, again, not, not anything crazy, maybe once, twice a week with, you know, water temperatures around high forties or fifties, uh, maybe, you know, into the low forties. My, my goldfish have been getting fed once a week throughout the, throughout the winter. And they're, again, their tank was 40. Um, again, that kind of helps the immune system because what studies are starting to look at now is gut health versus immune health. And again, this is not studied really in pet fish at all, but it has been studied in aquacultured species. And by, you know, taking care of the gut and making sure that that biome is correctly, the organism or individual themselves has a much better quality of life, better immune function, less stress. So I am all for giving them a little something throughout the season. Doesn't really have to be a winter diet. Um, this they have actually studied is wheat germ diets are not processed any better than normal koi diets. So fish protein, wheat germ protein processed exactly the same, no matter what the temperature. And that has been scientifically proven. So the wheat germ, unfortunately, is just a marketing thing. But again, they're going to process it both the same. So you can feed your normal maintenance diet all year round. Um, just again, be sure that you're replacing the bag every six months. Um, fish food, don't get those super awesome vitamin C stabilized products and vitamin C being a water soluble vitamin. Anytime you open the bag, some of that air is going to take the vitamin C with it. And if you open it, you know, consistently, even if you don't open it once a week, you're still going to lose a lot of that water soluble vitamin content. So after six months, we recommend, you know, getting a new bag. It does not make sense to buy koi food in bulk unless you're actually able to vacuum seal it. Um, that's really the best thing to do. And just make sure you keep an eye on the manufacturer's expiration date. Yes, we have a lot of clients that are confused about the manufacturer's, you know, expiration date on the bag. Yes, it's far on into the future. Some of these foods can last about two years, provided that you don't open them. So those expiration dates are on the bags so that the stores know when to take the bag off the shelf because the sealed product is no longer, I wouldn't say viable because a lot of expiration dates are just, you know, about when they might not be able to guarantee the health profile of that fish anymore. So question, what study paper would you like to see done for the most of the hobby? So actually, I'm going to be looking at this this spring. So I mentioned that I have a little goldfish pond. Right now, they're just hanging out. But I'm going to actually start doing studies on them with GI transit time. So I want to know how long food actually lasts in their intestines and how that changes with temperatures. Because obviously, the warmer that it is, you'd think that the food would move through faster. But again, how much of a temperature change has to happen until that takes place? And then again, anything that we're feeding... Orally, as far as medications, we'll know how long that kind of takes to come out of the system. So it's got to get a little warmer. My fish have to beef up a little bit. Um, so I am I am really excited to look at that and just kind of starting some nutrition studies. Um, I am interested in looking at various um, studies as, how, as far as how much protein an animal has to eat and how much ammonia output they will have. So I'm still working. I think my fish need to be a little bit bigger. Um, but obviously, you know, how much protein is going into their mouths versus how much that's going to change your water quality. And if you, you know, how much you have to manipulate the protein going into the diet to see with your water chemistry changes. Because again, fish eating protein 
they're going to have a higher nitrogenous waste output. And that obviously is going to affect the ammonia coming out of them. So again, it, it makes sense to me that if you feed them less protein, there should be less ammonia output, but I want to prove it. So working on that. Um, so yes, food get pushed through with muscles or just, just kind of slide. Uh, it's kind of in the middle. Um, koi and goldfish, again, very similar GI tract. It's not very robust. Um, they are omnivores. They actually don't have an acidic stomach. And their GI is a little bit wimpy. Um, I mean, our, our intestines are like good at pushing all this stuff through. But again, we're terrestrial animals. Them being freshwater fish um, with that are nice and super saturated, um, never dehydrated. Everything, you know, kind of slides with a little bit of mucus. But it, it needs a little push to keep to keep moving. Um, it's not really a straight shot in koi and goldfish. It makes a couple of loops back and forth throughout the fish. And again, that's just the nature of omnivores. Um, carnivores have very short tracks um, and usually some sort of acidic stomach to break down protein. Strict herbivores have a very long GI tract. Um, when we do in necropsies, you can actually try to spell out the fish's name with the intestine. It's that long. So, um, excellent question here about fish being constipated. Oh, one of my favorite myths to dispel. Um, so like I said, with their GI tract and freshwater fish, when your fish is in a freshwater environment, so tank, pond, anything like that, um, they are more dense than the surrounding environment. So water is constantly being diffused into their body through simple osmosis. And as a responsibility of the kidneys, again, our filtration caudal kidneys and the gills to get rid of that excess water, which is an active process. And with passive versus active, passive will win out every single time. So you cannot be constipated if you are not dehydrated. It's just, it's physiologically impossible. So then again, if it is too cold, fish is eaten too much. Um, we've really only had one case where a fish might have overeaten in the winter. And, you know, they, they, they do okay. We just usually cut back on the feed. Um, things will eventually move forward. Again, unless that pond is completely frozen solid, there is some sort of metabolic little tiny burst of activity. Um, but they, koi, goldfish, betas, they, they can't be constipated. It's, it's a physiological impossibility. Um, most of the times, if there is an issue with food moving through a fish, when it comes to koi and goldfish, it is neoplasia. It is a tumor that is sitting either on the intestine, it's gonadal sarcoma when it comes to koi. It is something that is physiologically blocking movement of food along the GI tract. So again, with, with koi in particular, um, they are prone to gonadal sarcomas. Um, it's something I have suspected for years. Um, we were working with another pathologist to try to confirm, you know, what type of tumors we were seeing in these koi that usually attack, you know, 12 to 14 years of age. They're a very large space occupying mass that we do not catch quick enough because it's just, you know, they might look a little bit bigger than usual. Um, but a lot of the times, you know, by the time the owner notices their fish is asymmetrical in the belly, the tumor is 70 to 80 percent of the salomic cavity. And really, it there, there's not much we can do for that. Um, so just submitted a case about a couple weeks ago, and we were able to confirm that it is an ovarian tumor. Um, we were actually able to catch it as it was you know, within the ovarian sac next to egg, like tissue, and we can see it changing from that structure. So that is really the most common neoplasia that we have in koi. And being a space occupying mass, again, with, within the salomic cavity, it, it's only so big. Once this tumor, you know, starts to grow, it's going to start squishing all the other organs out of the way. So you're not going to be able to move food along your GI tract. Your kidneys aren't going to be able to make any blood cells. They're not going to be able to filter anything. And that's where we start seeing the secondary signs of edema, of anemia, anemia um, 
And again, that's why I love my ultrasound so much because I can actually scan through the belly of a fish and pick those up fairly easily. Um, just comes from having a lot of practice and seeing a lot of these tumors. Um, usually we can do a fluid diagnosis. Usually these have a really gross fluid that's associated with them just because they have, you know, it's taking on blood. It has nowhere to put it out. So it just kind of puts it out into the space around them. So yes, cancer, cancer sucks. Fish, fish get cancer, shark get cancer. Every, I mean, anything with a cell, unless you're maybe a jellyfish because they have amazing reproductive capabilities. Um, can you know, it's not a perfect process. There are steps in place where, again, cellular division is supposed to be halted. But again, just like trying to, you know, keep computers doing what they need to do. It's not always going to be a perfect process. So, yes, absolutely. All right. So that is going to conclude our session for today. Thank you, everyone, for joining me. You guys asked great questions. Um, there was a question about the betas. Um, so YouTube Live for betas is going to be Monday, March 27th, which is also my mom's birthday. Um, and it's going to be at 2 p.m. Pacific, so a little bit earlier, because um, I have two more webinars to give after that. One for our careers in aquatic veterinary medicine. If any of you are interested in seeing what awesome things aquatic veterinarians do, um, that night will be my my great friend, Dr. Cara Field. She is in marine mammal conservation. So she works at the Marine Mammal Center here in California. And then we will have our koi session on koi pond water quality. So for those of you who would like to learn more about koi, um, we do have our koi health and welfare certificate program. Um, this is going to be starting up on March 1st, so just in a couple days. Um, so I'm going to put this in our chat here. So again, that is the Koi Health Program. It's available to anyone, anywhere. Um, we have a lot of great experts that are coming in to, to speak. And let me just put the beta. YouTube Live is Monday, March. March 27th at... 2 p.m. PST. Um, and yes, that's up on our YouTube channel as well. So again, thank you everyone for joining us today. Again, I love Koi. They're they're just, you know, they're 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 big and they're 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 fun to work with, and you get to do a lot of cool things. So I appreciate all of your questions. Uh, thank you so much. If you do want to buy our book, it's up on Amazon. You can get it in um, either print or electronic copies, and hopefully we will have an audio book available soon because that's how I get all my my books read while I'm driving around. So thank you again. I hope you all have a lovely day and I hope all your koi stay happy and healthy. <laughs>